Hello and welcome to this week's episode of When Life Hands You Lemons. I'm very excited for this week's conversation because I chatted with a fellow Full Sail alum named Maria Dion. She created a simple five-step management system that she uses for artists and producers that she consults with called the Musician Blueprint System. And she uses this system to help artists kind of learn and clarify their vision and what they need to be successful. It helps them find their ideal fans and clients and creates a simple marketing system that may, that helps them attract these people without spending a ton of money on advertising and hours learning the music business. Miss Maria and I talked about what a good pitch looks like. We talked about some of the stuff that you should be thinking about and should definitely know when you're working and looking for a manager. And she also goes in depth on what the Musician Blueprint system is and how it can really help you or any emerging artist trying to find their sound and place within the music industry. So without giving away too much more information, I'll just let Maria tell you who she is, how she got into music, and even at the end of the episode, she gets a little rough and tells us how and why you need to put your big boy pants on when you're reaching out to her or people like her. So thanks again for tuning in to this week's episode of When Life Hands You Lennons. I hope you enjoy my conversation with Miss Maria Dion. My name is Maria Dion. It's actually pronounced uh, Dion. Some people say Diane, but either way, it's perfectly fine. Um, Dion is actually my middle name. So my whole name is Maria Dion Crawford. So sometimes you'll see Maria Dion or Maria Crawford, or you'll see the whole name. So I go by many names. That's pretty much the point. (laughs) So my name is Maria Dion, and I am an independent artist manager. And I am a founder of a group called the Working Class Artist and Producer Network that I'm putting together. And I started my own company called Sparkswood Management, which is an artist management company, about two years after graduating from Full Sail um, in 2013. And so at the time I attended school, I was an aspiring singer songwriter and so I was trying to figure out pretty much how to become an artist and in the process of going through that I actually ended up becoming a manager (laughs) and so um but there's a story about that if you kind of if you want to know more about that I can kind of go into that a little bit absolutely I'd love to hear that stuff okay cool well uh, so I've always wanted to be a part of the music industry, like most people, right? It starts at childhood or somewhere. Mm-hmm. Um, but I didn't really believe that it could happen. And it's not that I believed it was impossible because, you know, there was plenty of other people doing it, right? That's pretty much how the idea got sparked. I saw an artist named Aaliyah. I'm not sure if you're familiar with her. She's an R&B singer that passed away from a plane crash in 2001 okay i think i've yeah i think i've heard her name i guess i haven't heard of her recently or anything i'd have to do a little more research on her yeah she uh she passed away a, a, a long time ago and so i had saw her like 1994 so i probably was like seven or eight years old so that's what kind of sparked it um so it's you know i knew that it wasn't impossible but i didn't know anyone personally who was around me who were like really living their dreams right So everyone around me is talking about dreams, but no one is really living them. So every day I just kind of had this struggle, this internal conflict, like I want to be successful in the music industry, but I don't really believe that I can, you know, how am I different from the people around me? We all want the same thing, right? We all want to be successful at, at something and yet none of us have it. And so I I kept getting uncomfortable, like the more uncomfortable I got with uh, the life that I was living, the more I started to entertain the idea of, like, well, what could happen if I actually take a chance? Like, what if I actually do become successful in the music industry? 
And so, you know, I just kind of play with it a little bit. Like, well, what's the worst that can happen? And pretty much what's already happening, right? I'm already living the worst of it. Like, not pursuing music is making me unhappy. So constantly entertaining that idea. Like, well, what could happen if I do it? No pressure. So I took all the pressure off. And the more I started thinking about what could happen, people and information started to appear. And so a friend had told me about Full Sail, and that's pretty much how I ended up at Full Sail. And so it was just constantly entertaining that idea and then realizing like, okay, well, they're here, but I have to take advantage of those opportunities, right? Like, I can't be afraid to talk to people I don't know. I have to read that book, even though (laughs) I don't feel like reading it and listening to that audio book, even though I want to hear some music. You know, I realized that I had to get a little uncomfortable, but um, it didn't matter because I was already uncomfortable. I was already not in music, so I had nothing to lose. And I already knew what failure felt like because I already wasn't being in the music industry. So. I made the decision that, you know, I'm going to be successful in the music industry and I'm going to be open to whatever that looks like. And as a result, being in the Full Sail University, going in with the idea of I want to be a songwriter. So how can I take this information, turn it into becoming a songwriter? Um, And I noticed I had a lot of friends around me who were pursuing music and they also, too, were struggling. And the one thing I found we all had in common was no one had a manager. (laughs) And so here I was studying entertainment business, learning about artist management, product development, and, you know, stuff like that. And so it was like, well, wait a minute. How about I become the manager that we all need? And so I realized that in pursuing that, there was more passion behind artist management than there was being a songwriter. You know, like I still write songs like, you know, it's still a thing that I like to do. But the drive, the passion, the determination came behind being a manager and being able to share information and help artists actually do what they wanted to do was more of success to me than actually being on stage. So that's how I ended up becoming a manager. (laughs) Cool. So you so you got more interested in the business side of the industry then you kind of forced yourself to go into that side or just kind of naturally happened? Well, I I forced myself to go into it because I realized that the talent part was okay. Like I could write a song with no problem. I could sit down and listen to some music and the song would come and that was easy. But the challenge was, well, how do I take this song and get it to people? And how can I take this song and, you know, do whatever they do in the music industry? And that was part of the problem. I realized that even though I was talented, I didn't know how the business worked. So being able to sing and being able to write, it was only a portion of the equation. I didn't know how the whole entire thing worked. And so it was like, well, I need to learn how the music business works so I can figure out how I need to do this. And so, you know, I was reading books, going to the library and going to the bookstore, buying music industry books. But if you don't know what you don't know and you're looking at this information, you still don't know how to take that and apply it. You have to go talk to an expert. And at the time, the only experts I knew were uh, college, you know, go to school and talk to a professor, talk to a teacher or something. So um, I didn't have any business people around me to be able to go ask to learn the business. So just having that knowing like, well, if this is going to work, I got to understand how it works so that I can work it. And then going to school and learning that, but just kind of paying attention to as I was taking the courses, I was getting straight A's. And so I was like, wait a minute, I'm actually really good at this and I'm kind of enjoying it. So at that point, I just kind of set the goal like, you know what, I'm going to I want to master this because it was a master's degree. A lot of people don't know that I actually have a bachelor's degree in criminal justice. So I kind of took a turn there after that because criminal justice is like a second passion. You know, it's almost kind of like if you need a backup plan, I did the backup plan first. (laughs) So 
criminal justice was like a passion. So I got that out the way. And then I went back to go pursue the music. And so once I realized, like, wait a minute, I'm really good at this. Let me try to, you know, I set a goal to to get a 4.0. And in doing that, it wasn't stressful. I was actually enjoying the discipline, the the deadlines and the projects. And then it wasn't hard to do that. I realized that that's probably something I should be doing more. So, you know, it's kind of hard sometimes to write a song. Sometimes you get it, sometimes you don't. But anytime you put, you know, the music business or something, entertainment business, it just it comes easily. And so because it came easily and I wanted to help people at the same time, it just kind of happened that way. Really? Yeah, it's it sounds you've taken some similar paths that I've I've had. Um, I've had similar issues because when I attended school at Full Sail, I had a very similar mindset. I'm like, I am dedicating my entire life to this because this is my passion. This is my dream. And I have to succeed at this because I, unlike you, don't have a backup plan. I'm like, this is what I'm going to do. This is what I need to learn. I got to figure this stuff out. So you setting that mindset of getting that 4.0 and having those deadlines, what how did you how did you maintain that or what what kind of goes around that tell us about that whole process well growing up in a family that just kind of believes in education in general i already had uh adopted from my family discipline so i was kind of already on that schedule of you know time management and productivity my parents taught me that at an early age you know be on time and when you're doing something do it don't half ass it do it. And so because I had already went to school the first time right out of high school, you know, how you just kind of don't really take it serious because you don't really understand it. So going through the first college experience and not really setting that goal, it was like I finished it. But in reality, I half asked it. So I didn't really know what to do with it. So this time in making the decision, it was like I was already uncomfortable. And I think that's really what it was like, just really sitting down and thinking about it. Like, you know what? This life I'm living right now really sucks. <laughs> and so why try something else and not fully dedicate to it? Because you already know what it's going to look like if you don't, because you're already doing it. So it was really just kind of making that decision, which was critical. But part of making that decision was to, I had to believe in myself. I had to really convince myself that I could do it and the way that I did that was not taking it so serious you know what I'm saying like mm -hmm. it's kind of it's, it's kind of hard like because you want to take it serious right but at the same time you don't want to take it too serious because if you hold it on to it so tight and then things are not going the way that you plan then you get frustrated and then you, you start to lose focus and so just having that belief that and, and starting with that idea that, you know, what if I did this? Like, what could this look like if I really do this and playing around with that and then just making it fun, you know, setting a deadline and then making it fun and actually enjoying it as opposed to making it like, oh, I got to meet this deadline. You know, it's different when you make the deadline versus someone else making it for you. Someone else is doing it kind of feel like it's work. But when you do it yourself, you're in control of it. So setting that goal, setting that, you know, that goal to get that 4.0, it was like, well, wait a minute. I'm already naturally good at this. I was get the first three months. I got A pluses without even trying. It was literally just, you know, sitting down, following instructions, doing the work, turning it in. It's like, oh, man, I'm great at this, actually. Like, let me put a little more effort into it, you know, and, and see if I can take this all the way there as opposed to just kind of, you know, letting it happen. And so mm -hmm. making that decision was just kind of like, okay, well, if I, I'm going to be great at this, then I have to focus. Mm -hmm. And so in order to focus, because I had grew up already in that discipline environment, I realized that that meant sacrifice. Mm -hmm. There was going to be some things I wasn't going to be able to do. So I mm -hmm. couldn't hang out with friends. I couldn't, you know, watch certain TV shows and I couldn't do a lot of things. But on the other side of that, you know, it was what was more important. I can go hang out with them when I'm done with this. You know, this is first. So I'll do that later. And so setting that 
goal and having that discipline is literally just making the decision to say, okay, here's what I'm going to do. And I know I'm going to be uncomfortable, but just kind of weighing the options. What's more uncomfortable, continuing this thing that's already making me unhappy or just being a little uncomfortable for now. And then I can always come back to that later. You know, I can always do that later if I want to. Let me just kind of see what this is, because this is new versus everything else is already there. Mm-hmm. I'll just come back to that. So really, it was just making the decision and following through. That's great information. And I think a lot of people need to hear that because it's funny because I literally had this conversation with somebody just before I had left work this after, earlier this afternoon and she was needed some motivation. And I told her to kind of sit down and write down like a three month goal, a month goal, a six month goal and just say, hey, you know what? This is what I need to accomplish by then. So then she could focus on what she needed to do. She needed to put aside some of the stuff. And I was asking her, like, what are some of the distractions in her life? And she was just kind of voluntarily telling me like, oh, it was my kids. And I had now that they're older, they can kind of take care of themselves. So I can focus on myself a little bit more. And I had like in my previous relationships, they were bad and they were holding me back. And now I I have this instinct that I need to just focus. Like I need to just focus. Like I'm going to be X amount of years old and I'm not getting any younger. So if I don't do it now, it's not going to happen. So I kind of helped her with some motivation. So it's funny that you tell that story because I had that conversation with somebody and I was telling them that you need to do it because me personally, I don't want to get to be 50, 60 years old, five, five years out of retirement to say, you know what? I wish I would have done that. You know what? I wish I would have done that. Or I wish I would have taken that dream vacation. Or I wish I would have done this and this and that. So I kind of had to light that fire under her. And that is such an important thing. And there's so many people that they're, they're so quick to come up with an excuse for anything, but they, they have an excuse for something so dumb, but it's like, okay, that really has nothing to do with this. Like you went out and you partied with your friends when you could have been making music or you could have been working on your business plan, or you could have been doing something way more productive. You're not going to live out your dreams if you're partying with your friends. I'm sorry, but that's not going to happen. And if it does, please let me know because I need to figure that out. (laughs) Right. Like I was just having a conversation with a friend yesterday. We were kind of touching on um, that, you know, people make excuses and stuff like that. And we just came to the realization that change is one of the hardest things to do. We all say that we want it, but at the same time, we don't like to be uncomfortable. That's why we would rather do that later if we don't feel like doing it. You know, and so we want change. Right. We we desire it. We we have the will, but it really comes with the two things like you got to believe that doing that new thing is really going to change your outcome and then believing that you could actually have that outcome. So if you don't have those two things, you know, people kind of go back and forth. It's like it's that conflict that I, you know, that I had like I want I want it. But I don't believe that I can have it. But then going further to even pay attention that you're doing that. Right. Because there's a conversation in all of our heads. We're all having this conversation. And so you want to do something, but you don't feel like doing it. And then there's this constant back and forth. But catching yourself to say, you know what? Well, well, why don't I want to do that? You know, let's explore that. Why do I not feel like doing that? And then really addressing it to say, well, well, let me just let me just play. Right. I got this terrible vision in my mind of what's going to happen if it doesn't work out. Well, let's kind of explore the other thing. What could happen if I try? Because I know what's going to happen if I don't. Exactly. So why not just play? Or, you know, I think sometimes we just take it a little too serious. Like it's OK to be serious, but that play is still important. And And I think that's what I did. You know, I was serious about it. But at the same time, I kept the playfulness to it. Like, I'm going to I'm I'm, I'm going to take myself serious, but I'm going to loosen up at the same time. Exactly. And I think that, you know, that's change is, is a very important thing, whether it's a good or a bad thing. But I think a lot of people take it as more of a negative thing because we we humans tend to think of the negative things or what if I move or what if I do this and this doesn't happen and then I'll lose money and then I'll do this, you know, but what happens if you don't do that? You know, think of the negative consequences on the other side. And that brings me back to your point earlier of you knew what failure was like. And to me, you don't want to 
fail forward. Or is that the saying? Is it you want to fail forward, not backwards? Yeah, yeah. You, yeah. you don't want to fail backwards, you want to go forward. Yeah. yeah, you want to fail forward. So if you're going to fail, make sure you're doing it in a forward motion. You're doing it that's going to make you learn something rather than, you know, if you don't do it you're losing something by not doing it or procrastinating or making an excuse. Well, I Talk- think that's a misconception about the word failure because people have expectations and when they don't meet the expectation, they're like, oh man, this is, you know, total bummers of failure. And it's like, well, no, because you still have an opportunity to try something else again. So I don't see failure as, you know, you, you try something and it didn't work out. I see failure as if you just completely stop altogether, then yes, yeah, a it's a total failure. But if you try something and it didn't work out, it's like you said, you there was something there. Like now you have new information. So you tried it that way and it didn't work. Well, now you got information. Well, it doesn't work that way. But have you tried looking at it from a different perspective? Exactly. And then try that and then see if it works. But something is going to work if you just keep trying and thinking about it. You know, that out of the box thinking, you turn it around, flip it over, upside down, go under, go, you know, as long as you just keep looking at it and and thinking about it and trying to figure it out, eventually something will appear. But if you just stop altogether, well, then, yeah, that's failure. But setting an expectation and it doesn't happen that time. Well, that's just that one time. Set another expectation, set another deadline and do it again and again and again and again and again and again until it happens. But if you give up. Right. And that's where the discipline comes in that a lot of people don't have discipline. They try a couple times because there's this idea that, oh, well, you're only supposed to do it this many times. No, you do it as many times as it needs to be done until you get there. There's no time limit on it. Just figure it out. Exactly. And I'm, I'm kind of in a similar situation now is you don't I, I'm trying to figure something out and I'm trying to work towards something and it just hasn't worked out the way I've anticipated or planned or had hoped for. But That doesn't mean I'm going to get discouraged and just, you know what, forget it. I'll come back to it in six months. It actually motivates me even more to keep working even harder. Who else? What other connections can I utilize to help me with this? Who can I have come in to support me? What can they do to support this goal or dream of mine? And another thing comes to mind is is a quote. Um, I don't know who said it, but I've it's it was I have not failed. I've just found a thousand ways that do not work. And that is so true. That's very important because with music, especially there, music rules are meant to be broken. Like there are rules, there are things in music that you're like, oh, you can't do this or this melody or this harmony doesn't work or this chord progression doesn't work. Well, you know what? You know, Bach used that chord progression or Ariana Grande, for God's sakes, just used it in her, her song. It's not to say that it doesn't work. It might not work like technically, but it sounds good. You know, just just if it works for you, use it. Yeah. Yeah. I see rules as blueprints. I don't exactly. see them as like this is how it goes. Like when you think about if you just like think about a set of stairs, right? You can walk up each stair or if you're brave enough, you could skip a stair. If you're really brave enough, you can skip two stairs. You know, it's like it's there for you to, you know, play with it. But it's not it's not this thing where it's like you have to do this the exact way every single time because if you did that then everything would sound the same and look the same everything mm-hmm. would be the exact same thing if rules were meant to be follow it this way every single time like no <laughs> no it's a blueprint yep yep just with the stairs just don't go leave from the bottom to the top stair that might not be a good idea yeah right. yeah that's a, yeah it probably won't work you're definitely going <laughs> to fall Fall or hurt, hurt yourself. yourself as a, yeah, like, you know, that's just like that. But again, that, that's common sense. <laughs> yeah, that's common sense. That's right. And if it's if it's not common sense, it's called natural selection. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, unless you're doing some jackass kind of stuff or you're doing it on purpose because that's the whole point. Well, then I can, I'm there, right? I'm there for the show. I'm all for it. But if you're doing that with the expectation that that wasn't going to happen, well, that's just stupid. Yeah, right. So let's come back to your kind of starting your company and you're out of school or did you start your company before school or what was the inspiration behind starting the the Spark Sparkwoods management? Yep, Sparkswood. So in school, um, in the master's degree program, what they do is you're writing a business plan. So there's no, you know, dissertations that you have to speak in front of people or anything like that. In the entertainment business master's degree program, you're working on a business plan. So for 12 months, 
that's every project I did was basically building up for the final business plan. So when I graduated, I had created this multimedia company. And that's the thing. Like, I didn't know anything about business plans at the time. So, you know, I'm just kind of winging it. And they're telling me I'm doing a pretty good job. And then I, I come out with this plan. It's like, oh, yeah, you can go start a business now. <laughs> and it sounds great. But even in that moment, I realized, OK, I got this. I think my business plan was like maybe 32 pages long or something like that. It's like I have this plan. It's a very detailed plan. It's outlaying financial projections and everything. But I realized that even though I had all this education and I had this plan and I had these skills, um, there was a few things I was still missing in order for those things to work. And that was marketing and the financial part there were a few gaps that I could only get from actual experience. So coming out of that, um, I couldn't go right into my business so that I didn't start it. And then plus, you know, I was still having some trouble with the name. You know, I just, I had to come up with a name. I had three days to come up with it. And so, you know, the original name I had, um, I can't even remember what it was, but you know, it was some random thrown out thing that just kind of made sense at the time just to get the project done. And so the structure was in place, but I knew I wasn't ready for execution yet. There was still some things I needed to learn. And so coming out of that, um, I decided to get a job in marketing. But right on the end of that, like I graduated in November 2013. So I want to say like September, October. Now, keep in mind, I'm still doing this singer songwriter thing. Right. I hadn't fully transition into management and so I ended up meeting a producer at Full Sail and just playing around again like hey let's make some music I wrote a song called uh Overnight in Paris it was an R&B song and surprisingly it hit the desk of Clive Davis it hit the desk of um Ebro Darden who's a media executive and radio personality at Hot 97 in New York I'm not really sure if he's doing that still. But then it also hit Jay-Z. Wow. And it was like, yeah. And then so I, the phone call came with when the producer was at my house. And, you know, he's asking these questions. And the crazy part was I didn't have any of those answers. You know, just regular answers like, oh, so, you know, well, what are you guys trying to do? Like, you know, what's your overall goal? And like, what's the mission? Like, do you have a project ready? Things like that. And again, I didn't know. It was just a song. We were just playing around. We didn't know it was going to do that. <laughs> and so because uh, I wasn't prepared for that opportunity, you know, I, I missed the opportunity. And so I didn't understand how important at that moment uh, project management is to music business. Right. So we get to talking about artist management, but it's like, what exactly is that? And I didn't understand that until going to full sale where it's like, well, you know, managing the artist, which is a person. A lot of people don't understand that you're managing a person. It's like you're being married to that person. So you got to get to know that person, their personality, what they're good at, what they're not good at. But you have to know how to help them navigate through what they're trying to do. If the artist doesn't have any clarity, you can't help them, right? Because they have to know where they want to be. It goes back to what I was saying before. The belief and what it could look like. And so in order for a manager to be able to help an artist, they have to have clarity. They got to say, well, here's where I want to be, or here's where I think I want to be. And the goal of the manager is to figure out the plan, like how you did for, you know, your friend, like you got to come up with the plan. But in order for the manager to come up with the plan, the artist has to have clarity. And so for those things to come together, project management is very, very important to the music business in general. And so, you know, I realized I was really good at artist management because I was really good at project management. I'm really good with deadlines and times and discipline and organizing things like that's, that's the natural part. And so that's why it just came kind of easy. And so, but at that time, I didn't have that understanding. So I missed that opportunity. You know, I never got a chance to talk to Jay-Z like that whole, like literally opportunity is gone. It's just a memory now. <laughs> and so ever since then I've cont I've continued to study the music business so that's about 
six years now and counting because I'm still doing it. And so um, project management is important. It's not separate. It's it, it, it's a part of it. And so learning how to put all those pieces together is that's really what it's about. Because it's not just one thing. It's learning how to to see that this over here is relevant to this over here and this over here and this over here. And then having the skill to bring all those pieces together into the plan and then execute it and then just see what happens. Mm-hmm. That's that's great. Um, I, I, I like all of that um, because there I'm sure we've all been in situations where we've been presented with an opportunity. Sometimes we we're aware of the opportunity coming up in a week or two days or two weeks or a month and we just weren't prepared for it and sometimes we have those that come out of nowhere like you said it, it hit the, de- the desk of Clive Davis it hit the desk of Jay-Z and you had that phone call and you just weren't prepared for it so making it look like you were on top of it would have kind of changed the direction of that whole conversation and potentially changed your entire life will you talk about how maybe you've been presented with other opportunities and you just weren't prepared for them or what you kind of do now to make sure that you are prepared for any situation that may be thrown at you? Well, ever since then, I've never not had an opportunity I wasn't prepared for. <laughs> I, I'm sure I you can know? imagine. <laughs> that was a really big opportunity. And so that was kind of like a blow. Uh, uh, it took me it took me quite some time to kind of recover from that. Like, I'm not going to lie. That almost kind of made me really want to give up because it was like, you know, I know that some people say that, you know, some things are just once in a lifetime. And some people say, oh, well, you always get another chance. And for me, I just kind of feel like I don't think I'll get another chance like that. There will be something else, but it will never be a chance like that. That was that defining moment, you know, like, well, what are you going to do now? You know what I'm saying? Because you can't call them back. They're like, they don't even know who you are now. Like, you know, so much time has passed. And, you know, how do you come back from that? And so ever since then, you know, I just took a moment and really was honest with myself about that. You know, well, why weren't you prepared? Well, for one, obviously, there was a lot of stuff I didn't know. But two, if I'm being honest, I was scared. I had no idea how to have a conversation with those people even if they were in my face, right? Like I have no, I probably would have stuttered. Like I probably would have cried. Like I have no idea Mm -hmm. what I would have done. And it's not because I was starstruck, but it's really because, you know, I know what they can do, right? We've seen it, but I still hadn't tapped into myself yet. So it was me understanding at that moment the reason that opportunity failed wasn't because I wasn't talented because I was it. My music got, I got one song. I didn't even, it wasn't even on iTunes. Like it's not anywhere. You can't find that song anywhere. And yet that opportunity came for me just doing that one little thing that we did. We didn't put it on any online distribution sites or anything. We didn't do any of the traditional marketing that the experts say you have to do. None of those things happened. It only happened because the producer used to be an intern at Hot 97, and he pretty much was just like, hey, I did this song, check it out, right? Just regular stuff. And then that's pretty much how that happened. But I realized that even with all of those things, had I had clarity of what I was doing and what I wanted to do, even in that moment of me not being prepared, I still could have been prepared. You know, that it didn't have to, like, whatever the outcome it could have been some kind of outcome. But the reason why the opportunity was there and it just disappeared was because I had no clarity. So when they asked me as an artist, you know, tell me about yourself. And I can't answer that in a way that matters to you. Well, why would you be interested? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, I couldn't answer that question. I didn't even know what kind of artist I wanted to be. You know, I, I mean, naturally, I'm a R and B hip hop girl. I was raised with, you know, R and B and hip hop, and so I was kind of going after that. But at the same time, it, I, I had no clarity. I didn't know where I, you know, the the vision wasn't there. Like how it's clear now, you know, it wasn't there. Well, what does a music career really look like? I don't know. I hadn't thought about it. You know, does it include Grammys? 
I don't know. I hadn't thought about it. You know, so how many projects do you want to do? I don't know. I hadn't thought about it. Well, what's you got this one song, Overnight in Paris. Well, you know, what's the whole project going to be? I don't know. I hadn't thought about it. So that's just it. There was so much uh, vagueness. There were so many things I didn't know that I should have known as an artist that was completely separate from business. I should know what I want my music career to look like in two to three years. No one else can answer that question for me. Only I can answer that. Mm -hmm. You know, and I didn't have those answers. And, and in a bio, same thing. When someone asks, tell me about yourself. I don't know how to answer that question that doesn't put you to sleep. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so, you know, just all these things that I had to be honest with myself. Like, you know what? I don't really know myself. I, all I know is I like writing. Writing is fun. It feels good. I like music. That's it. But that's not going to get me where I want to go because I was there and this opportunity came. And it could, didn't go any further because I couldn't answer those basic questions. You know, mm -hmm. what is the vision? It, how long do I plan on being here? Am I trying to retire from the music industry or am I just playing around? Right. Am I just trying to be here for two, three years? Do I want to be a one hit wonder? Like, what's the what's the goal? And so these people, Jay-Z and all the other celebrities and all the business people, they're in it for the long run. Right. They have visions and business plans and they're trying they're being here till they're 70 and you got quincy jones as a producer he's still going mm -hmm. and he's in i think he's in his 80s mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what i'm saying like they're in it for the long run and so they don't want to partner with artists who just playing around you know they're serious about what they're doing but at the same time they have the element of play right so they're like they're playing but they're serious because this is their life like how you said right I'm dedicating my whole life to this. This is what I'm doing. They want to be surrounded by people and artists and producers and musicians who are on the same page that they're on. They in it for the long run. So they want to do business with artists that's for the long run. But they have a definition of what the long run is. If you don't have one, right, they don't trust you. They don't know if you're going to be here long enough for them to even waste their time or, you know, invest. It. And that's the biggest thing, right? Nobody wants to waste their time and nobody wants to waste money. So if you're an artist and you have no clarity, why would a label sign you when you don't even know how long you're going to be here and you don't even know if you really want to do it? They don't want to go through all of this work with signing contracts and paperwork for you to turn around in a year later because it, right, expectation, it didn't meet your expectation, you don't want to be in it anymore. That's a waste of time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I just had to get honest with myself and ask myself, what do I really want? And so after having that experience and then graduating from Full Sail and realizing that even with that experience and closing and having that business plan, I still was not ready. Right. I believed in myself and I made the decision, but I still wasn't ready. It was a lot of learning I had to do. It was a lot of experience I had to get. And I was patient in doing it. So I took the time constraint off. It, this doesn't have to happen in a year. Right. I gave myself some time and took the pressure off. OK, five years. Right. I need to be here in five years for me to take myself serious enough to keep going. And once I set that goal and kept entertaining that, it grew. And that's when it ended up shifting from artist, from a singer songwriter to artist manager. I realized I was way more valuable to the music industry in general by being a manager as opposed to being another being another songwriter. Because, again, when you ask me about that, I can't give you clarity because it's it's just that music is fun for me. It's enjoyable. I like playing around with it. When I feel like writing a song, I write a song, right? There's no pressure. Uh, there's no deadlines. Like, if it gets done, it gets done. If it doesn't, it doesn't. A record label will... I'm their worst nightmare. They will be like, girl, if you don't get your ass in there and write this song... <laughs> and I'm over here like, well, you know, it just ain't coming. I'm going to go do something else. You know, I'm their worst nightmare. They would never mm -hmm. sign me because I would never sit down and do it. Now, if I wanted to go work for a label and be a manager, they would love me because deadlines come natural. Planning, 
comes natural. Structure comes natural. I'm always early, so I'm always on time. You know, they would love me in that aspect. And so being honest with myself, I'm good at music, but am I the best at it? Mm -hmm. And that's when I realized that, you know what, I can still play and have the music career that I want. But if I'm being serious about being successful, then I have to do what I'm good at, too. I can't just do something I like. I have to do something that I'm good at so it can move fast and easy for me at the same time. That's that's really good information as well. I I like that whole story. So thanks. Thanks for sharing Um, that really kind of comes back to what I was saying earlier and kind of that feeling of failure and you were presented with that opportunity, but you failed, but you severely learned a huge lesson from that. And you learned that that's, I'm never going to, I'm going to make sure that that never happens again. And I had an episode, which is actually out today where I chatted with Elliot Jacobson and we talked about kind of the importance of learning the music business, the business side of the music industry, rather than just an artist learning and knowing how to write music. It's also important for them to kind of have a general understanding of how music distribution works or how copyrights work or how royalties work. You don't have to be a lawyer. You don't have to know all that stuff. You just have to know kind of like copyright 101, trademarks 101, royalties 101, just basic information so that when you're presented with an opportunity, you'll have a basic understanding of that stuff and you're not getting completely screwed over. You'll have, you, it won't be complete technical jargon to you. And I like how you drive home the point of clarity all the time. I think that's a very, very good word. And in that episode with Elliot, we talked about learning the business side of the industry and we talked about learning all of that stuff, but we didn't touch on how important it is for like, let's say an opportunity is presented to you, like you were presented with the opportunity to potentially work with Jay-Z and you weren't prepared for it. That's important as well. Having all of your ducks in a row, having everything kind of straightened out rather than you're just, everything's all over the place. When you're writing music, when you're working on a project, whatever it may be, make sure that everything is lined up. Make sure that all of your ducks are in a row. So if a music executive comes to you tomorrow or in two weeks, you'll know exactly how to respond without even skipping a beat. You might be faking it till you make it, but at the same time, they won't be able to see that. So I really like that point of you talking about clarity and defining your vision. What do you want? Because at the end of the day, that's what the label's looking for. That's what Jay Z's looking for. He's not going to waste his time on somebody like, like me or or you, like you had said, because I don't have anything. Like I can't define myself. I can't define myself as a musician. But if Jay Z wanted to work with me as a manager and manage an artist, he would love me because I can meet the deadlines. And you've defined that vision for you yourself. You've clarified everything, and you've kind of decided like I'll play with the music, but. I really like the business side of everything. Mm -hmm. And that's the basis of the management company that I created, Sparkswood Management. So the whole foundation of the company is to help artists artists and producers. Let me make that clear, because a lot of management companies just kind of go after artists. My thing is I realize that music producers are often kind of left out and trying to figure this thing out, too. And so my management company focuses on artists and producers who are at the ground level. So, you know, I'm going back to who I was back then, right? I I got this talent, it's stuff that I'm good at, but, you know, I can't answer the simple questions. So my management company focuses on helping artists and producers gain clarity before we talk about anything else. And before I tell you what I can, because I don't know what I can do for you, right? I, I can tell you what I've done for someone else, but what I can do for them was based on them. It was based on what they wanted. It was based on who they are, which has nothing to do with you. So my company focuses on helping artists and producers get clarity because a lot of people don't know how to do that, right? You ask yourself, well, well, yeah, what do I want to do? I don't know what I want to do, right? So sometimes you need people to kind of help guide you even through figuring that out. And because I've gone through this, I'm not going to lie. It's a ridiculous process I've gone through. (laughs) Mm -hmm. It's very ridiculous, but I love the fact that I've gone through it because going through it, it has given me so much clarity. You know, I can't stress that enough. It gives me so much clarity. And when you know, and you can see you have 
amazing confidence. And people who don't know and who don't say, they'll look at you like you're crazy. They'll think you're legitimately out of your mind. And that's only because they don't know what you know. And so I realized there's a lot of musicians and producers and artists, they give up. You know, they're already working too. So you got working class artists and producers, right? Doing mm-hmm. this over here. And then in their free time, they're trying to figure this out. And then they can't figure it out. And part of the reason they can't figure it out is because of lack of clarity. So my management company focuses on that specifically. And to make sure that I can help as many people as possible, I decided to take everything I learned at Full Sail and turn it upside down and do something completely different that the music industry isn't doing. Because I noticed that traditional artist management right their contracts their long-term contracts and it's all based on the same thing planning organization but it's this intention that hey we're going to get this in order then i'm going to go out here and talk to people and set these things up then you're going to get money then i'm going to get 10 percent of that that to me just takes entirely too long for both the manager and the artist especially when the majority of the talent they don't know the business like you said it's going to take you a little more time to get to that money establish those relationships when you're dealing with someone let's say let's say they don't want to go to college let's say they're fresh out of high school 17 18 and they're talented and they know right because you got some kids who just know for sure music is what i want to do don't tell me nothing else i don't want to hear it that's what i want to do there's no one out there for them because the music industry says well you don't have enough experience right so go bump your head a couple times go scrape your knee go figure some stuff out then come to me and i'll help you And I just kind of think that that's ass backwards. And so I figure, well, I can come in and help artists develop their business. So I'm real careful when I say artist development, because I understand when people use those terms, you know, you think about the talent part, vocal coaching and stuff like that. But my management company focuses on developing the artist's business at the ground level. If you know nothing about music business, then you are perfect coming to me because I understand not knowing anything about the business and also not knowing how to even have clarity that matters in the business. Cause you probably got clarity of yourself, but you probably don't know how to answer certain questions that matter to the business. And so that's what I'm here for to help you get that understanding, to help you get that clarity and help you put the simplest plan together. So that whatever goal it is that you want, it doesn't even matter if it is to win a Grammy, if it is to eventually become a mainstream artist, I know how to position you to get there. And so I'm not a traditional manager. I don't do long term contracts because I just feel like it's time consuming and I want to help a lot of people. So I set a goal to help 10,000 struggling artists and producers to help them build their music careers and then trying to figure out, well, how in the hell am I going to do that? 10,000 art. That's a lot of artists. <laughs> and so I, again, because I'm good with setting goals and deadline, I know I can do it. it I got to give myself time. And so I set a goal for five years from now. So five years from 2019 to touch 10,000 artists and producers who are at the ground level. So maybe you're just coming out of high school or, uh, you know, maybe you're in college or maybe two or three years already in trying to figure it out. You'd be perfect coming here. And so in trying to figure out, well, how in the hell am I going to do that? Because that means I got to do, like you said, basic one on one. This is music business, artist management one on one. How can I help you coming right out? And so and just kind of sitting back and thinking about the big picture. And then how I set my company up, I realized that independent artists, mainstream artists, and DIY artists, if you don't think DIY and independent are the same, (laughs) they're all using the same thing in the digital music landscape. And it's four things. It's a website. It's social media profiles. It's networking profile or networking sites. And then there's email. And so I was like, wait a minute, everyone's using this. And so I created the musician blueprint system. 
But instead of you just trying to, you know, wing it and figure it out because the experts are telling you, hey, you need this, you need it. They're right. You do need a website, right? You need a place where people can go find out whatever they need to find out about you. You need your own place. So you definitely need your website. You definitely need social media because that's where the people are. You want to go where people are. You want to be able to attract them and talk to them and things of that nature. But this networking thing, artists are always talking about networking, but the professionalism is not there, right? They don't know how to to talk music business. So the professionalism is lacking. I can't tell you how many times I've gotten artists hit me up on Instagram, they're DMing me, and the way that they introduce themselves is like, well, no wonder you're not going to get signed. You, That's not how you introduce yourself. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So it's like, okay. You need to understand that. And then email. A lot of people don't think that email is relevant, but we all have mobile devices and everyone has an email address. If you're paying bills, you got an email address. <laughs> and so, so that's a way that you can communicate with your fans. That's a way. Usually, right, when you have a business card and you're at a networking event and you're exchanging it, you're usually talking through email if you're not on the phone. And so just realizing that this is the stuff that we're all doing. We're all doing these things, but we're not doing it in a systematic and organized way. So when you're on your website, you just scatterbrain. When you're on social media, scatterbrain, right? Like there's no clarity, no clarity on social media, no clarity on your website, no clarity on any of these things. You have all the right tools, but because you don't have the information and you lack clarity of what to do with these things, this is why it feels like when a branding expert comes and say, hey, you need to pay for social media ads. No, you don't. Right. At the level you are, you probably don't need to be paying for ads. My philosophy is if you're not making money, you shouldn't be paying any money. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like if you're a musician and you're not making money off your music career. Now, that's what I mean when I say you're not making money. I'm not talking about your day job. That's separate. If you're not making any money in music, you should not be spending any money. Don't you don't need no ads because you got free advertisement already on social media. If your following you have on social media is not already giving you some kind of return back, why would you spend money on ads? You're wasting money. You know what I'm saying? You just you skipped the step. Like you said, you went from the bottom step and you just went all the way to the top. There's levels to it. And so once you learn how to use a website effectively. And once you learn how to use social media effectively, so all of these things are designed for us to use them to save us money. How are we spending more money? That's because we don't, it goes back to that belief again, right? We don't believe that we can actually do what we want to do with the tools that we have. We feel like it's out of reach. And as I'm noticing, it's not. Beyonce has a website. Beyonce has three social media profiles Beyonce has email that's it you Mm -hmm. can have email you can have so you know what I'm saying you can have the same exact thing and some people will be like oh that's Beyonce she's a celebrity it doesn't matter the fact of the matter is you have access to the same tools that she has access to hers is going to be different obviously right it's not supposed to be the same but it's the point to understand that the tools and resources are available you just have to know how to use them So I created the Musician Blueprint System for musicians and producers and artists to show them how to use these tools effectively, according to an artist manager, right? Because that's the whole point. If I'm your manager, these are some of the things we're going to be working with. And so the, the Musician Blueprint System is a very easy and simple four step strategy that helps artists do music business very quickly and it includes a content marketing strategy at the same time so you don't have to pay for ads you just use your music use what you're creating and put your marketing content in what you're creating to attract the right people you won't have to pay anything if you do it that way and so i created the musician blueprint system and it's a checklist so artists can, you know, follow the checklist. But I realized that, you know, I just didn't want to put a checklist together and just say, hey, figure it out. Because at the end of the day, artists want to work with a manager. And so I created 
the Musician Blueprint System workshop. So if they want the checklist, they get me too. And so we work together. But again, it's a workshop so that I can have groups of artists, not contracts, right? Because for me, this isn't about money. I'm not trying to make any money. Obviously, I want to make money, right? (laughs) But if you understand how business works, once you do business, you make money. So money is not even the primary goal. That's secondary. And that's what artists need to understand. If you're a musician and you have art and you're going to put it out there, you're going to make money. The key is to make sure you're positioning yourself correctly so that the money comes. You don't have to work so hard for it. If you know how to position yourself to attract the right people, the opportunities will come like it did for me. And I didn't even have all that stuff together, right? Opportunities will come. And if you're ready for those positions, then you don't have to spend a lot of money. You just need clarity and you need an organized way of doing things. And so artist management is not accessible. And so that's what I've done. I've created an artist management company to make artist management now accessible. It's where you're not competing to work with one manager. I have, I work with, well, because it's new. I just created the website. I mean, I just created the workshop. So it's an opportunity to get 100 artists at one time inside of the workshop to work with me. And it's for a year. They get access to the Musician Blueprint System workshop forever. Once you're in there, you're in there. You get all the information. It's there. It's not going anywhere. But you get access to me, a manager, for 12 months with no contract and no commission fees. So what I'm teaching you, you make money. It's 100 percent yours. Because you're an independent artist. I want you to maintain your creativity. I want you to be in control of your money. You're independent. So you should be in control of everything, including your money. I don't want anything. My goal is to position you to be what you want to be. And if you want to be an independent artist, then I want you to be independent. So my job is to position you to show you how to plan to accomplish that goal. Nothing more and nothing less. And to make sure that it's accessible, I figure if I do it this way, then I get to touch those 10,000 artists. And again, if an artist is like, well, you know, I still want a traditional manager. Cool. Well, now we can position you, right? That's a part of your plan now. Position you to get that traditional manager. So when you get there and they ask you, okay, well, how many fans you got? So you can actually answer that question. And then when they say, well, How much money are you making? See, you got an actual answer. You can answer all of these questions and meet all of these qualifications that the traditional managers want you to have in order for them to sign you because now you're ready. It sounds like the 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 musician blueprint system is kind of like the go to session for anybody that is like you said just starting out and you want to position these people and that's so important in today's industry and like we had discussed earlier a lot of artists don't understand the business side they don't know how to market themselves so you are preparing them for you're asking them that that important question is if Jay Z were to come to you right now and ask you, what is your vision or what do you want to do with your music, you would be able to thoroughly and efficiently and effectively answer that question. And Jay-Z would be blown away by it. And not being able to answer that means you're not A, clarified on all of the information and you're not prepared. So that is so important. You need to have a preparation plan for all of this stuff. And I know that you had talked about in the musician blueprint system that social media and content strategy is also part of this. So a lot of artists will create a social media account, but they're not really active it active on it, say on their personal account. So they're like, well, I created a Twitter account. Now what do I do? Can you explain what that process is a little bit and what should an artist do or what are a couple things an artist can do to get their social media going, what they should be doing on, on social media? Well, content marketing, basic fundamental, well, fundamentals behind it is to use your content as the actual marketing piece. So instead of creating music and then trying to create an ad for the music, you simply turn the music itself into the content. So for example, music videos, 
if you really pay attention, music videos are an example of content marketing. Because inside you have two things here. You have a message. There's right. The song is promoting a message. Whatever the song is saying, there's a message there. And then you have the image, right? The imagery that matches that. And so when people are watching a music video, they're not just looking at you perform. They're not just listening to some music. There's a message that this song is promoting. And that's what's making them make, you know, they listen to it and they decide whether or not they like it or they don't like it. It's not always about the sound. It's not always about if the music, you know, if, if if they jump to the music, if they were dancing to the music. People are listening to music because it provides an experience. It's an emotional experience, despite what many people think. And when you listen to a song and you can relate to it, it's because there's a message it's promoting that they can identify with. So if you're talking about a struggle and they've gone through a struggle, then those people who've gone through that struggle are going to relate more to that song. So why not use that? If you wrote a song and you want to get this song out to people anyway, why not post content about your song on Twitter instead of just a random picture about nothing, right? Like why not break your song down, take pieces of your song instead of posting, even like taking a still shot of, the video and then you know not even putting a caption I, like i can't tell you the ridiculous things i've seen i've seen images and then there's just like nothing there i don't even know what i'm looking at and that's part of the problem is like as an artist you want people to understand you right that's biggest things oh i'm misunderstood well part of the reason you're misunderstood is because you're not telling people <laughs> you're not explaining to people what this is. What are you trying to do? What's the purpose of it? How do you want them to feel? Like you're not explaining any of that. You're, you're not just putting it out. You're not clarifying anything. I see, there go that word again. There it goes. There it goes. Yep. <laughs> exactly. You're not telling them anything. You're just putting this out there, and you're leaving it for them to interpret. And any time you do that, miscommunication can come. And then that's where you have some brands that you know it's confusion. Because you don't say anything in the beginning, then all of a sudden you start talking and the people don't believe you because they don't know. They don't know what to think. Well, this song, right? You got this one song is talking about this. You have this other song that's talking about the complete opposite. They have no idea who you are. And then you're like, oh, I'm just diverse artists. Like everybody's diverse. OK, we all have different skills. We all have doing th we are doing different stuff. But there's a common denominator under all of that. Right. You can deviate from the norm, but there's a norm at the end of the day. And so what you do consistently is what people are looking for. They want to know who you are and who you are is what you do consistently. And so every time you put a song out and it's promoting the same kind of message. Right. They brand you as that artist. And so if you coming out and you're always talking about love, then you, you, you become this branded artist about love. And so if that's what you're doing, then that's what you should be posting. But you got to figure that out. You got to know what it is that you're trying to do. If you want to be this artist, right? Like, what are you trying to do? What do you want to be remembered for? What do you, how do you want people to feel? You want to make people feel good? Okay, well, give that a definition. What does that look like? And then that's the content you should be posting. And you should not deviate from that because it's going to confuse people. And it's okay to sprinkle a few things in there every now and again. But again, remember, we talked about change. People don't really want change. It confuses them. It makes them uncomfortable. So if you're walking around saying that you're all about love and then next thing you know, all of a sudden you, you're you angry about something, right? But then you don't explain to people why you're angry. You just confuse them. Wait a minute. All this time, this artist has been talking about love and then here they come with this hate album. I'm confused. And, and so people don't support it. And it's not because they hate it. It's because they don't understand it. And so these social media pages, it's just full of all this different stuff. It's cluttered. And with so many different music artists and so many different choices, if you're looking at something that's confusing, you're not going to keep looking at it. Right. You're going to look at something that's comfortable, that is not confusing you. It's not making you feel uncomfortable. And so that's what they should be posting on Twitter. That's what they should be posting on Instagram. That's what they should be sharing. The message. What are you promoting? What are you standing for? What's the point? What's the purpose? What are you trying to do for them? How do you want them to feel? 
You know, like what is what is it? What are you trying to help them do? And that's all that they should be seeing because that's what's going to keep them coming back. They don't really care about you. Right. <laughs> you know, they don't really care about you. They care about you in terms of what you're doing for them. So if you don't understand that the reason why your fans are coming to you because when they listen to your music, it makes them feel better. If you don't understand that, that's a problem. You should know that because once you know that, now you can tap into that, keep giving them that, and they'll start buying it. Mm -hmm. But nobody's buying it because you're like, yo, check out my album. It's dope. It's fly. No one knows what that means. I don't know what that means. <laughs> Your definition of what's cool is completely could be completely different from my. Give me a description of what cool is so that I can easily make a decision whether or not this is for me or if it's not for me. But if you leave it there and say, figure it out, I'm not going to figure it out because that's too hard. With me, because I'm, 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 I'm a publicist, but I'm also a music journalist. I, I write for some electronic music blogs. And so music publicists and artists, DJs, promoters, whatever, are hitting me up with new music that they want me to cover. And some of it is so confusing. It There's no, st like for me, I'm always, I've talked about it on the podcast. I've talked about it on other podcasts. I've even written blog posts about it. And the importance of having a story behind your music. If you send me a link to your, a SoundCloud link, to your new single or your new EP or your new album and you say, hey, just released this yesterday or it's coming out on Friday or next week, check it out, then that's all you give me. How am I supposed to know? What do you want me to write about? This is completely up for interpretation. I may think that it's about love and moving on and happiness, but you think it's about you know, like sleep deprivation or depression or anxiety, you know, it's, you know, the, I'm as a music journalist, I want to convey your message because at the end of the day, it's your brand. People reading about your music on this blog and that blog and that publication, and you're doing this interview, if none of that stuff is kind of congruent or flows together, people, like you said, are going to get very confused. They're going to get super confused. And that's one thing I've always pushed. And I always like, I, if somebody just sends me a link to their SoundCloud or a Spotify link and they send like one sentence, I just delete it. I don't even respond. I don't read it. Nothing. It just right into the trash because what do you want me to talk about? This is completely up for my interpretation. I may hate the song, but if you were to explain it a little bit more and tell me that this is about a, a huge moment in your life or when you started writing music or something that kind of was a turning point in your life, that might turn me around and I might have a completely different perspective about it and, and really kind of connect with you on that. So I, I think that is so important. And it sounds like what you're saying is exactly the same thing. You've got to have a story. You can't confuse. Music is so much up for interpretation. And you have to make sure that it's your interpretation, not anybody else's. Because at the end of the day, you're the one releasing the music, not your fans, not your mom, not your grandpa, not your brother or your sister. It's you. <laughs> right. So Yeah, and so having that clarity in the beginning and communicating that clarity helps you attract the right fan base, but not only the right fan base. For producers, it helps you attract the right artists to work with. And just in a general sense, music business professionals. So if you do want a label, you know what I'm saying? Maybe the label is looking for an artist that's doing more love songs because they fill up everything else. If you're communicating that, you know what I'm saying? They can see that and then they'll, you know, they'll come to you. But if you're not sharing this information, no one knows. You want people to guess. You want people to come ask you. Again, you're not asking people. They're not going to come ask you either. Yep. Exactly <laughs> they're just going to make an assumption. They're going to make an assumption and they're going to go on about their business with that assumption. And as an artist, that doesn't work for you because your whole entire thing is you want them to get it. Well, in order for them to get it, you got to tell them. Exactly. And if I have to, if you send me an album or a single or an EP and I have to go back with you three times is asking like, Hey, what's this about? Oh, it's about my, it's about my dog. Okay. Well, what about your dog? I don't have time for that. I got time for the, I've got time for the person that just responded to me or just sent me an email or a pitch an hour ago that has a press release, all of their pictures. They have an entire story. They've got a biography. They've got everything laid out to me. And like you said, that opportunity, when you're pitching me your music, that's an opportunity for you to be featured on the blog that I'm writing for. And if you're not prepared for that opportunity, I'm moving on.
Mm-hmm. So it's just it comes it comes full circle. If you're pitching your music or whatever you're doing, you've got to be prepared for it because I'm. What do you want me to do? Just go into the blog and just paste a link to your SoundCloud and hit publish? Like that's not going to exactly. get anywhere. And the problem is that they they don't know. That's it. They they have no idea. They don't know how to. Well, one, they don't even know that they're pitching. You know what I'm saying? Like they're doing things that they have no idea exactly what they're doing. Like you're, anytime you do that, you're pitching. The problem is it's a bad pitch. So you just need a good pitch. Do the same thing that you did, just better. Right. And, you know, I get these bad pitches and I'm thinking like, I'm thinking like, oh, Jesus, take the wheel. You know, it's like, what, what are you doing? Like, what is making you think that you can just send something so simple and it, it, you're going to get success with that? Like. It's it's not going to happen. It's hoping. They're like, oh, man, I hope that they care enough. And, you know, they ask me the right question. And that's just it. Yeah, the right people will ask you the right question. But someone you want to write about your music, that's not the person. No. <laughs> no. That person is not going to ask. They they already doing stuff. They need you to come ready. And it's I've I've went on this soapbox so many times and it's i'm just thinking like all these artists who you know you're just fishing you're just basically you're putting on a blindfold and and you're you're shooting a bird shot out into a field hoping you'll hit something you know and it's like that's not the way to go about it and it's unfortunate but these artists learn the hard way because i don't respond to any of them i've got i don't have time for that i don't have time to sit and ask you 60 questions just to figure out that you know, your song was about your dog dying. You know, you, sh- you could have easily said that and told me the story behind that. You know, it's it's not that difficult. But to some, apparently, it is. So, yeah. Um, unfortunately. Well, that's why I'm here, to save you from the drama, from those who really want it. That's yep. why I'm here. You are here to take the wheel and help them drive, rather than <laughs> hoping for them to figure it out. Because some of us all need that sometimes but sometimes people need it constantly and yep i care someone cares someone does care because we know you don't because you're don't know how to write an email or you don't know how to hit somebody up and message them professionally it's it's a an unfortunate it's an unfortunate world we live in yeah kind of all the questions i have for you i think you covered a lot of information you covered way more than i was was expecting so thank you for sharing all of your insight um i really appreciate you taking the time to be on the show um before we before we kind of close everything out is there anything that um you want to add or how can people kind of follow up with you if they have any additional questions or even maybe check out the musician blueprint system well right now because The Musician Blueprint system is fairly new, and I want to make sure that I get the right artist inside of it. Um, What everyone can do is pretty much just visit the website, sparkswoodmgmt.com, and I actually have kind of like a free video series that I've put together, so they can sign up for that. It's free, and um, it's going to happen on Facebook basically. So what will happen is everybody who signs up for that, I'm going to send them a Facebook group invite because again, it's, it's it's an exclusive community, right? Because this is artist management. And even though I want it to be accessible, um, the right people have to get in it because it won't work. And so even though, you know, it's not an exclusive long-term contract and stuff like that, I still have to make sure that the right people get into it. So they can't just get in it, right? Because they're going to be working with me. So I have to make sure that they're compatible for it because it's still artist management, right? It's like you're marrying this person. You still have to work with this person. You got to make sure personalities match and stuff like that. And so it's not a very complex process. It's very simple. Um, And so they could just go to the website and just sign up from there and then Everything else happens from there, but they have to sign up. Can't go around me. You got to put your big boy panties on. <laughs> oh, I love that saying, regardless of how offensive it really is to you gotta some people. You got to put your big boy panties on. Yes, I said boy in panties. I did. You got to put them on and you got to talk to me. You got to talk. You have to not be afraid to communicate. And again, I'm here. As you can see, no judgment. See, mm-hmm. you can send me the ridiculous email. I'll respond to it. You said you just throw, you just delete. I'll respond to it. 
Maria's Maria sounds like she's unlike me. She'll respond to the ridiculous ones. I don't respond to the I do. ridiculous ones. I do. I that I, anything that comes, I respond to it. I'm not even gonna lie. Now, if if you're ridiculous and I'm in a bad mood, oh yeah, I'll be nasty. Like if, if it's stupid, I'll let you know it's stupid. But I do my best not to do that. But mm-hmm. for the most part, yeah, I'll respond. So again, you're looking for somebody who cares. I'm here because I don't know anybody else who cares. Because when I was looking for me, I wasn't even there. So I became who I needed to be so that I could do what I needed to do. And now I've become the person I need to be for other people who are looking for it. So it's here, but you got to want it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You got to want it. That's what my uh, eighth grade math teacher told me. Eye of the tiger. You got to want it. Um, and whenever we were kind of feeling down, if you didn't, you didn't want it, then you're not going to succeed. And kind of going back, I remember a little story back in when you said, put your big boy pants on. Um, I, I, I love that because some people take so much offense to it and I love it because it's so cut and dry. Like it's like grow up, but it's like the big person version of it. Um, I, back in high school, I, there was some, some, one of my teenage, my, one of my classmates was griping about how she didn't want to do this or she didn't want to do that, or she shouldn't have to do this. And I told her, you know what, you need to put your big girl pants on. And she, she, I swear she took the biggest breath I have ever heard. And, uh, she was so flattered. She was so offended. And I, you know, I looked at her and I'm like, you know what? It's true though. You need to put your big girl pants on and you need to do it. And I don't think she ever talked to me again. And I got in trouble for it, I think, because she got offended because she was still wearing pull up. <laughs> she sure was. And they were starting to get a little wet. You need to change them. But yeah, I that was that was great. So you put your big boy pants on, whatever you got to do and start that conversation if if you want to start succeeding. So thanks again, Maria. I will put all of your links and all the information that you um, talked about below in the show notes. So everybody things kind of readily accessible for the listeners. Uh, Thanks again for being on the show. I really appreciate you taking the time. Thanks again. Oh, no problem. Thank you. And there it is. Thank you so much for tuning into this week's episode. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Miss Maria Dion. We had a great conversation about all kinds of stuff, and I'm so excited that she shared her musician blueprint system that she had created, because I think it's kind of a unique approach, and I love her approach to artist management and how she kind of comes in and rather than trying to do business with you, she comes in and tries to educate you so you can take that knowledge and do business better yourself rather than being taken advantage of, which I think is a huge turning point and can be a very successful point for Miss Maria. So as always, I hope you enjoyed the conversation. I would appreciate you if you signed up for my mailing list as it helps me notify you when new episodes are live. The link will be in the show notes below. In addition to the mailing list link, there is a Patreon account, which helps me raise money for the show, as well as kind of give back to you, and you can potentially work with me. There is also a guest request form in the show notes. If you or somebody you know would be a good guest for the show, please fill it out and or send it over to them. Have them fill it out and it will come back to me and I will reach out to you if or the guest if they are a good fit for the show. Lastly, I would appreciate if you would give the podcast a five-star rating in Apple Podcasts or a review in whichever platform that you choose to listen to your podcasts on as it greatly helps me grow the show and help it be discovered by new listeners. So thank you so much again for tuning in to this week's episode of When Life Hands You Lenins. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Miss Dion, and I will see you next week on When Life Hands You Lenins.